Good morning. Uh, Hawa's testimony is one that you'll probably never forget, but uh, to make sure that you don't, I want to invite Hawa to come join me this morning. Would you, Hawa, come and stand with me? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> How well, this morning, uh, the title of my sermon is Hope Springs Eternal, yeah. and it's just a message of, of hope, and you, you've been through so much. You know, a lot of us probably don't understand the context that Howell came from, but in Sierra Leone, um, I've written down some notes, so I won't mess this up. Uh, from 1991 through 2002, there was a terrible civil war that happened in, in Sierra Leone, and it was very much over diamonds. Uh, there was uh, a group of people called the RUF, the Revolutionary United Front. These were rebels, and they uh, developed quite a, a military machine. And they terrorized people all over the entire country. They, uh, they were responsible for human atrocities that were rarely matched in history. Many tens and tens of thousands of people were killed, but uh, because the slogan of the motto of the country was, the future is in your hands, referring to the fact that people could vote, the RUF took thousands and thousands of people, primarily children, and cut their hands off, and took the hands and, and dumped them at, at government offices to make a point. And, uh, and Howell was one of those victims, and thousands and thousands of others were as well. And yet you stand before us today, and God is using uh, something that was so terrible in your life to bear witness to his goodness and his mercy. And, and you're, you're telling the world, I wanna go back and I wanna forgive the people who did this to me. And that, that's a very noble spiritual goal, and that's definitely getting out of the boat, as we've been talking about. I just want to ask you a question, and I, I know we haven't talked about this. I'm putting her completely on the spot, but can you just describe to me your hope? I mean, you have a lot of hope to go on after you've lost your hands and you've seen and experienced such terrible things, and you have this hope that you're going to go on to be a pediatric doctor or a teacher, and you're going to go back and help children. What, what, what is the source of your hope? And that's, she's 21 and I just put her on the spot here. <laughs> what is the source of your hope? What, what, what keeps you going? Um, God keeps me going in young life and in my family. Yeah. Yeah. In light of all that's happened to you, do you, do you still feel that God is good? Yes. Why? God is great. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Would you give Hawa a hand and just show her your love? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You know, it's it's really easy for us to begin to think that God is not good, God doesn't care. If things don't go the way that we think they should in our lives here as Americans, you know, the, the financial crisis or we, we end up losing our job or we have problems, you know, when we're teenagers, we think uh, because somebody broke up with us, it's the end of our lives. We're, we're just ready to throw ourselves off a cliff, right? And then you see someone like Hawa who has experienced such terrible loss and atrocities in, in her, her life. Her mother died, uh, her birth mother died uh, of a terrible snake bite and her father recently passed away. But she's been adopted by a loving family here in the States. She moved here when she was 14, she's 21 now. A beautiful young lady with a, with a great future. And so it leads us to this concept of hope. What, what is hope? If we don't understand what hope is, then we're really going to miss out 
on, on this whole concept of getting out of the boat because getting out of the boat requires a tremendous amount of hope. I want to read you a, a psalm this morning. This feels a little bit hot to me. I don't know if you can bring it down just a little bit. Uh, psalm 33, and I want you to, to read along with me if you have your Bible, Psalm 33. It's one of, the, one of my favorite psalms. Um, I'm going to begin with verse 4. And I want you to listen for this concept of hope. The word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, their starry host by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea into jars. He puts the deep into storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. The Lord foils the plans of the nations. He thwarts the purposes of the peoples. But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever. The purposes of his heart through all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he chose for his inheritance. From heaven the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. From his dwelling place he watches all who live on earth. He who forms the hearts of all, who considers everything they do. No king is saved by the size of his army. No warrior escapes by his great strength. A horse is a vain hope for deliverance. Despite all its great strength, it cannot save. But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those whose hope is in his unfailing love, to deliver them from death and keep them alive in famine. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love rest upon us, O Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Will you pray with me? Lord, I ask uh, this morning as we go into your word, after hearing such a compelling testimony from Hawa, that, uh, that you'll help us to understand that you, you deserve to be and are rightfully the source of our hope. And we put our faith and trust and our hope in you. It's in the name of Christ I pray. Amen. This word hope is, is a little difficult uh, because it can have a couple different meanings. And so I want you to do something, uh, both here at our World Campus and at our Quivira Campus. I want you to take just a minute, turn to your neighbor, and tell them what hope means. Not what your hope is, just define the word. What, what does hope mean to you? Okay? Take a minute and just do that. Talk to each other. What does hope mean? What does that word mean? All right, let me see a hand. Tell me what hope means. Yes, one of you. You believe in something for the future. Okay. Anybody else have a different definition of hope? Yes, ma'am. Never quitting, never giving up. All right. Yes, ma'am. Sir. Okay, all things are possible, even if the means are not visible. Okay, good, good. All right. Let's, let's see what old Webster has to say. Uh, in, in terms of defining hope. There are basically two definitions. The first one says, the feeling that what is wanted can be had or that events will turn out well. That's number one. Number two, a person or thing in which expectations are centered. The first definition uh, is this sense that hope is a feeling. I feel hopeful. I feel optimistic that things are going to work out all right, I feel good about my chances that I'm going to uh, get what I want. So hopeful then is, is a word that fits into the same category as sad and happy and angry. The word hopeful is an emotion. It's a positive, optimistic feeling. And that feeling of hopelessness leads us to say things like, well, we just have to hope things are gonna work out okay. Or we can't lose hope. 
We can't give up hope. And what we're actually saying is that we have to hold on to this, this feeling of hopefulness in order to get through uh, whatever challenges lie before us. We have to be determined to remain positive and, and optimistic. And certainly people who are not hopeful are miserable creatures who tend to be cynical and chronically negative. It's, it's not fun to be around people who are not hopeful. And we think of people who are suicidal as those people who have no hope or find it impossible to, to be hopeful about, uh, about their future. So it's easy to think then of hope as something that you have or something that you don't have. Now, almost as though it's, it's a, a personal attribute. Either you have it or you don't, right? Now the other definition of hope says nothing about a feeling. It defines hope as a person or a thing in which all of your expectations are centered. So let's go back to the boat. We're on our last Sunday of this Get Out of the Boat series, and you, I'm not gonna have you turn to Matthew 14 because I know you know the story by heart by now, right? But remember the story. The disciples are in the boat. They're in a storm. The wind is against them. They see Jesus. They're afraid. Jesus says, don't be afraid. It's just me. Peter says, well, Lord, if it's you, call me to to come out of the boat. Jesus says, come. And Peter gets out of the boat. The water is firm beneath his feet. He walks a, a ways, and then he sees the wind, and he's afraid, and he begins to sink. He says, Lord, save me. Jesus saves him, says, Peter, you, why'd you doubt? And they get into the boat, and all the disciples are amazed and say, truly, Christ, you are the Son of God. Now, look at the story in terms of this concept of hope. Either one, it's a feeling, or two, it's a person. What kind of hope does it take to get out of the boat? Is it the hope that things are gonna work out okay for you? Is it a feeling that, that I'm gonna be positive and I'm, I'm, I'm going to just determine to, to, to be optimistic about my chances of getting out of this boat? And I know every time I've ever stepped into water before, I sank, but because I have faith and because I have a positive attitude, this time the water's gonna be firm. Is that the way that Peter's thinking? No, Peter's thinking it's Jesus who's on the water. And Jesus is calling me. And because it's Jesus, I'm going to do something that makes absolutely no sense at all, even though I'm scared out of my mind. I'm going to step out of this boat. And he does. And the water is firm because Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. Jesus is the Son of God. And Jesus can make water firm. And then Peter discovers it is Jesus, but I'm still Peter. (laughs) <laughs> and I'm still afraid. I, I had this initial burst of courage, and I stepped out, and, and, but now I'm afraid. And as he's afraid, he discovers I'm sinking. I'm failing miserably. And he cries out, Lord, save me. Now, is his hope that somehow he can swim? Is his hope that the, that the boat is going to drift somehow close by so he can grab it? Or is his hope in a person who is capable and competent to save? You see, because Jesus Christ is pretty good at saving people who are going under. And so there is this difference between having a feeling of being hopeful and centering the expectations of our life in a person who is our hope. In Psalm 33, David says, the Lord looks down and sees us all. He considers everything that we do. And David observes, and you know, no king is saved by the size of his army. No warrior escapes by his own strength. A horse is a vain hope for deliverance. Despite all of its strength, it cannot save. I love the way Eugene Peterson paraphrases this verse in the message. He says, Horsepower is not the answer. No one gets by on muscle alone. 
So if your hope is in your optimism or in your skill set or in your good looks or in just being lucky, your hope is in vain. In Luke 6, uh, Jesus tells a very simple story. You've heard the story many, many times. And it's the story about two men who are going to build a house. And one man uh, feels hopeful. He feels really hopeful that storms are just not going to come in my life. And so he builds his house on the sand. And although he is hopeful and he is optimistic, he is wrong. And the storms do come. And when they come, they destroy his house. Another man builds his house on the, on the rock. And he has to dig down. And it takes much longer. And it's far more work. But he builds it upon a firm foundation. Because his hope is not that he's going to be lucky or that things are going to turn out okay. His hope is that this rock is not going to move. (laughs) And the storms will come, but built on a firm foundation, my house will stand. And so I ask you this morning, what is your hope? Where is your hope? What is it based upon? Who is it based upon? Do you go about your life clinging to some thread that everything's going to be okay, that everything will work out in the end? Is your, is your hope that the economy's going to turn around? Is your hope, was your hope, that the right president was going to be elected? Getting out of this boat that we've been talking about for the past several weeks, including our new vision as a church, stepping, stepping out into the waves, Overcoming this fear of the wind that that comes up as a response to us getting out of the boat. Managing our fear and and dealing with the fact that we will fail. Every last part of everything we've talked about for the past five weeks rests on this one question. Where is your hope? Because our hope cannot possibly be in the way that we feel or, or what we can accomplish or how things are going to be. Our hope, the center of the expectations, is based on who is doing the calling. Who is walking beside us? Who is doing the saving? Who is making the promises? Who is the atonement for human sin? Who is the master of the universe? Who is the great I am? You see, and if our hope isn't in that guy, then our hope is in vain. And I'll confess to you this morning, I struggle with not always feeling hopeful. I have have periods of time when I can be just as depressed and sad and fearful and lost as anybody else in this room, I promise you. I have times when I don't feel hopeful. I get get discouraged and, and, and I feel fear and I suffer that sense of exhaustion and I just wanna crawl into a cave someplace and, and not come out for a while. But let me tell you something. I never lose hope. I never lose hope. You can knock me down a hundred times, and a hundred times I'll get back up, and I'll tell you why. Because my hope is secure. Jesus Christ is the center of my hope. He's the center of my expectations, and I know that I will fail, and I disappoint myself all the time, and that's why I feel less hopeful, and that's why I want to crawl into a cave, and that's why I deal with fear and failure, because it's Jim. But this life and my purpose is not about me. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow regardless of what comes. Because he lives, the victory is won. Because he lives, I will not fear death and I will not be dismayed regardless of how much I suffer in this life. My hope is not a feeling that is conditional upon my circumstances. My hope is that God's nature is unchanging. My hope is that God's nature is good. My hope is that God knows what he's doing. And my hope is that God will never, ever, ever stop loving me. Listen again to the 33rd Psalm. The word of the Lord is right and true. 
He is faithful in all he does. The earth is full of his unfailing love. The eyes of the Lord are on those whose hope is in his unfailing love. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love rest upon us, O Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Now, I paid a lot of money to get a theological education, four years in college, three years in seminary, Let me just sum it up. Biblical Studies 101, here it is. You want to see and understand the scriptures and know what God's trying to say? Always look for repetition. Look for the repetition. Look for the repetition. Where did you see it? My hope and unfailing love. And this is it. This is is the critical catalyst to everything we've been talking about is that our hope must be securely placed in the unfailing love of God. Maybe you feel that, uh, that you have failed miserably in your life. God's love is unfailing to you. Maybe you feel that you've missed your opportunity to, to make an eternal impact in, in this life in the way that you, you fulfilling your call. God's love is unfailing to you. Maybe you feel that you have failed at being a parent. God's love is unfailing to you. Maybe you are experiencing health problems or marital problems or financial problems. God's love is unfailing to you. Maybe you've experienced terrible atrocities and somebody has cut off your hands. God's love is unfailing to you. Your hope and my hope and the hope of this world is that God's love is not fickle. God's love is unfailing. If your hope is in anything other than God's unfailing love, your hope is no hope at all. Remember the great hymn, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' love and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. His oath, his covenant, His blood support me in the overwhelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is is my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When I was... um, a boy, I was raised in Wisconsin. You guys know that, I've told you that, I'm a cheesehead. But what I haven't told you is why we moved from Wisconsin to North Carolina when I was 14 years old. Because we, all my family was from there. We, like you, I thought forever I would be in, in Wisconsin, in, uh, in the town where I grew up and where all my family was. In the early 70s, I was born in 1970, get over that. Uh, <laughs> But in the early 70s, my parents started a real estate company. It was called Home Key Realty. We lived in a small little town, about 7,000 people, so it wasn't a, a real estate mecca to be sure, but they were doing pretty good. And then the recession hit in 1979 through 1982. And as many of you know, it was a time that was a bit scary like now. And interest rates uh, shot up to 21.5%. Inflation was at 13.5%. And the housing market literally shut down. In the course of three years, my parents lost their business and, and eventually the bank took our house. We had four teenagers. And so we sold everything we could. We loaded up everything else in a truck. Mom, dad, four teenagers and a dog headed south to start over again. My dad was 38 years old, the same age that I am right now. And I remember the prayers at the dinner table when we had macaroni and cheese for like the fifth night in a row. 
And the prayers were not that the economy would turn around. The prayers were not that somehow, you know, we would get a decent price for our house, which of course we didn't, the bank just took it. Our prayers was that God's love was unfailing and that he would provide and that he had a plan and we were just going to trust him. And we moved and we, all the kids got jobs and, and I learned the meaning of hard work and res- financial responsibility. I, we started attending a church and there in that youth ministry I, I discovered and was confirmed my sense of call to ministry. I went to a, a college then in North Carolina. It was there that, that uh, my mind was shaped and, and I met my wife. And it was because of all the lengths of events that happened one after another that now has led me to stand before you here today. So like Hawa, that which seemed so terrible and so difficult is nothing more than another reflection of God's unfailing love. So that's what hope is about. It's not about your circumstances, it's not about the way that you feel, It's about, is God who he says he is, and is he that good, and is his love unfailing for me in this life? On this side of life or on the next, our hope must be in God's unfailing love. But there's a little bit I want to tell you quickly before we close about hope. It needs to be cultivated in our lives. Our hope in Christ needs to become the prevailing thought in our heads that drives us on and helps us to see all that happens in this life with this grace-filled, hope-filled perspective. The problem is, with most of us in America particularly, is that we fill our minds with clutter. We, we read junk. We listen to junk. We watch on TV and at the movies and we look at junk on the internet And it's impossible then to be anchored in hope when our minds are filled with this clutter and junk because we forget. And if we have enough of that stuff in our minds and we're saturated with all this junk, then we lose sight of our hope. And so you need to know that this hope needs to be cultivated in your life. It's it's steadfast and it's true. But if you're going to see it and be able to participate in it, you're going to have to think about what it is that you allow into your head. Orberg says it this way, we can survive the loss of an extraordinary number of things, but no one can outlive out hope. When it is gone, we are done. Therefore, the capacity to stay focused on the presence and power of God in our lives becomes supremely important. So I just want to give you a few things to think about in closing as we think about our hope and cultivating that hope within our thought life. Number one, I want you to remember that what we think largely determines who we are. What we spend the most time thinking about will have a profound influence on everything that we do. And of course, what we do has a tremendous influence upon what we're thinking about. If you want to live your life as one who is on a mission to serve God and make eternal impact, you must begin to think thoughts that produce those kind of characteristics. And here are some really practical suggestions for you. Pay attention to what you feed your mind. If what you're listening to or watching causes you to sin or it causes your mind to turn away from God, turn it off. Drastically reduce the amount of time that you watch TV. Read a bit from the Bible every day, particularly in the morning. Listen to music that has an uplifting, God-honoring lyrics because those messages get played over and over and over again in your mind. Get involved in a, in a life group devoted to studying the Bible and, and, and some of the books like uh, Orberg's text that, that we've been looking at uh, over the last couple of weeks. Write down the verses that inspire you. Post them up someplace so that they serve as reminders of, of God's promises and purposes. And then journal. Journal about what you're learning, about how God is demonstrating his unfailing love in your life, even during the hard times, especially during the hard times. So all of this is to say, fill your mind with reminders of God's unfailing love so that you will keep in sight who it is that is your hope. And obviously, spend time in prayer. 
every day as much as possible and, and keep it real. Prayer is a conversation between you and God. It can go on all day long. It doesn't have to be real formal. It can just be a conversation with the one who loves you and knows you and is your hope. Finally, make worship a priority in your life. Not, not just an hour on Sunday, though. This hour is very critical. But learn how to worship wherever you are. And worship is just to lift up God and, and, and give him our due focus and attention. Because he is our hope. He is the center of our life's expectations. So, that's it. That's six weeks of getting out of the boat. I hope that as we come to the end of this series, that you, you have sensed God's call for you to come out onto the waves where he is. I know I have. And as a church, we've, we've looked at our vision together, and it's daunting at best. And we are gonna begin to, to listen to all of your thoughts as they percolate up. We're gonna put teams together and move towards that vision. But more than anything, I just hope that each and every one of you will sense God's unfailing love in your life. And you'll hear that call, and you'll take that leap of faith to step out of the boat. Because this is what you were created for, to live on the water. (laughs) We all wanna live on the water, right? So take that step of faith. And, and I hope that you'll share your stories with me and, and with your site pastors, and, and together we'll see where God leads us. Let's pray together. Lord, it's been a good, a good six weeks. Many of us have felt pretty stretched by what we've been reading and hearing and, and considering. I pray this day that when all is said and done, and as we get the opportunities to step out of the boat and, and we experience the wind and we sink and we experience your, your hand pulling us up and saving us again, that it just will restore our hope in you, that our hope will be secure and deeply embedded in the one who is capable of saving, who is capable of, of stopping the river, of making, making the waves still and the water firm. We love you. We thank you for your unfailing love for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.